With China having wrestled the deflationary spotlight away from U.S. banks lately, it's worth taking a few moments to, to take stock of where we are. And stock is probably the wrong word because when we use the term of def, the term deflation, it often has some specific connotations that can be misleading if we don't really if we're not really careful about our terminology here. Deflation, I think a lot of people believe, certainly in the correct monetary context, it's a contraction in the supply of money. Well, that can and has happened through various points in history, supply isn't necessarily the issue here. As Stephen Van Meter and I were talking in a recent video, it's more about circulation than it is supply. How much of the available money supply is circulated. And if it's not circulating in the same way as it had before, the same way the economic and financial systems require, that becomes an impediment in the free flow of finance and economy. Therefore, the deflationary symptoms on the economy, some of which could be falling prices, but mostly the burden falls on workers. So China is our big deflationary warning sign right now in the way that U.S. banks had been just a few months before. But what does that mean? For most people, it's, well, China's just China. That's too bad for them, but we're over here. What does it matter? But as Steve pointed out in that recent video, there really isn't any decoupling. And the reason, one reason why, there's several reasons why, but one reason why is the monetary channel, the lack of circulation, the impediment to circulation, which in the modern system means risk aversion among dollar providers. And so we want to know what dollar providers are doing and how do we tell what they're doing? How can we, how can we get a window inside the dollar providing activities so that we might be better informed about potential disruptions in circulation? Again, it's not about supply. It's about the risk aversion or the risk taking of the suppliers, of the circulators, of the redistribution agents throughout the euro dollar system. And a lot of those redistribution agents and a lot of that redistribution and recirculation, first of all, has to do with collateral as a major impediment or a major, part, a major greasing of the wheels. And second of all, a lot of that redistribution, especially where it comes to China, goes through Tokyo. So we want to pay attention to collateral. We want to pay attention to Tokyo and Japan, banks there, to get a, a much bigger and hopefully more rich picture of the overall monetary circulation, whether or not it's still going well, whether or not we're seeing signs of deflationary money. And with China already experiencing major issues that we can see in CNY, CNY continuing to fall, which is one of those signals that is consistent with an impediment in the free flow of money and credit through the euro dollar system via Tokyo, we're already on alert. But first, I'm Jeff. This is Eurodollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. If you're interested, Eurodollar University, not only do we have memberships and subscriptions for you, we also have a webinar coming up on September 1st. There's a link down in the description below, which gives you the details on the webinar. Again, September 1st, it's a Friday. It'll be in the evening, 6.30 Eastern Daylight Time. I hope to see you there. We're going to go over some stuff, some more of these detailed details that we don't get a chance to go over here on YouTube. So if you're interested, I welcome you and please check it out Friday, September 1st. And again, Eurodoll University has research subscriptions and memberships available. You can find out information about those at our website, eurodollar.university. Now, I remember when this came out back in September of 2020, my old co-host and friend, Emil Kalinowski, emailed me and said, did you write this for the Wall Street Journal? Because it sounds like this article came directly from your keyboard. And here it was in the Wall Street Journal, mainstream financial source of all places, talking about the proper way to consider the yen carry trade, because it isn't the way most people write about it. It isn't the way most people talk about it. The yen carry trade isn't you have to borrow yen in order to, to go find uh, uh, more better opportunities, better investment returns other, other, in other places around the world. It's a little bit different than that. In fact, it's a lot different than that. And instead, the real yen carry trade is a euro dollar redistribution node. So part of the euro dollar system, big redistribution, Tokyo, Japan, and the Japanese banks that engage in this have very close contacts into China. 
So this is September 2020. You wonder why this wasn't written 30 years ago, but still, September 2020, the Wall Street Journal, this is what they started out with. The Japanese government bond market is rarely considered interesting. With yields literally pinned at zero and less than zero, and trading practically non-existent, it has limited appeal for discussion even among the most cerebral international investors. But beneath the placid surface, the trade in short-term government, Japanese government bills and deposits conceals a thriving world of dollar funding, which offers hints about developments in China's banking system too. There are massive amounts of dollars that get swapped and borrowed and synthetic repos and all sorts of stuff using Japanese government securities, the bills that we've talked about before, as well as yen reserve deposits as collateral to engage in not a yen carry trade, but dollar redistribution. And since Japanese banks have close contacts on the dollar side, as well as close contacts on the Chinese side, you can understand why Tokyo is such a crucial redistrib redistribution point, not just from China, but for all across Asia, usually through their Hong Kong connections. So that's what it had been historically. So this yen carry trade, euro dollar redistribution, it tells us something about both sides of that of that trade. What is going on in China? What are the Chinese or what are the Japanese banks thinking about opportunities and risks in China? And what are dollar providers thinking about providing dollars to Japan to redistribute to China? That's what we really want to know. So it may be surprising for some people because you know, it's understandable why we have this popular perception that the Japanese government bond market is, as the Wall Street Journal article alluded to in its introduction, dead. Not a whole lot of trading there. Besides, the Bank of Japan owns almost the entire market through one QE after another over 20 some years, especially QQE, where they scarfed up every little bit of assets that are available. And while that might be true to an extent in long term government bonds in Japan, the short end of the curve is quite the opposite. As the Wall Street Journal article was confirming, there is a vibrant dollar trade going on at the front end because it's not really about the Japanese government bonds or the Japanese government bills in particular. Instead, what happens is Japanese pension funds and insurance companies that have all of these obligations that they need to meet and can't meet them through the pitiful investment returns they get on safe and liquid bonds in Japan, they're more than happy to seek returns outside of Japan, but they can't do it using yen because yen is not the world's medium. The euro dollar is. So they turn to the euro dollar market to secure US dollar denominations, which is ledger money of US dollar providers around the world. But essentially they swap into US dollars. And because they need to find better returns elsewhere, they're willing to pass along some of those returns to dollar providers. So what happens in a swap, typically, is the Japanese will, will get dollars, they'll borrow dollars from a counterparty in the euro dollar system, and they'll post yen collateral for that swap. And what that means is the dollar provider ends up with usually some, some yen deposit account or more likely Japanese government bills. And because the Japanese government bills yield next to nothing or often negative, what the dollar providers are thinking is we don't really care about the investment return of the Japanese government bills. We're actually getting paid on the swap. Because Japanese uh, financial companies are interested in returns elsewhere, they're willing to pay a premium, and that premium is variable. It moves through time based on conditions. The Japanese are willing to pay a premium to anyone with spare dollars. So as far as the dollar providers are concerned, they're only looking to protect themselves in case of something going wrong in the dollar providing activity. So the Japanese government bills that they're getting, they're only t they're accepting them not because of the investment return, but because they're safe and liquid and they can be liquidated at a moment's notice. You won't lose any money. We don't care about the return on the Japanese bills, even if they're negative returns, because we're getting paid on the swap. And the more desperate or the more there is demand from Japan for dollars, the larger that premium becomes, the more you see demand for Japanese government bills, including in the situation where we might see Japanese firms who are 
shall we say, in trouble, having issues rolling over previous funding arrangements, whatever they might be. They might be, they might be plain vanilla straight up repo where they're using, say, treasury bills as collateral. Suddenly they've borrowed treasury bills through some other financial situation. And now treasury bill becomes short in supply for various reasons that we've talked about. We won't get into here, but we've talked about all the time on this channel. What do you do as a Japanese dollar borrower is one potential uh, option for replacing that rollover that you were doing before. You can't get your hands on treasury bills to roll over your funding arrangements. You might engage in one of these swaps as a sort of last resort emergency. So what we can tell in an indirect way, but a very reasonable way, in a very historically validated way, we've seen this time and again, not just over the last couple of years, but going back quite a long period of time, we see that whenever we have indications of a collateral shortage in the US dollar system, the situation I just described where Japanese firms were using treasury bills as collateral to acquire dollars, suddenly they can't acquire treasury bills in the same way, but you still have to roll over dollar funding. They increasingly might turn to these Japanese, or these dollar for yen swaps, which means demand for Japanese government bonds goes up. Trouble in the US dollar collateral system, Japanese government bills end up becoming a substitute form of collateral for collateralized arrangements. So what you would expect to find and what we do find is that the prices of Japanese government bills go up at the same time we see the same thing in treasury bills. When there's a shortage of US dollar collateral, especially US treasury bills, which are at the top of the pyramid or the bottom of the pyramid, however you want to characterize it, with treasury bills being the best quality collateral, if they're in short supply because Japanese firms are always in need of dollars for various reasons because of past, past activities as well as what they're trying to do and continue to do for, moving forward, you see Japanese government bill prices go up, their yields go down. Even though they're negative, they get to be more negative. And over the last couple years, in particular 2022 into 2023, earlier this year, that's exactly what we saw. A very close correlation between treasury bill prices, therefore yields going down, and Japanese government bills, prices going up, yields going down. Oftentimes prices going way up and yields going way down because Japanese firms who have dollar commitments in a very panicky and emergency situation are using Japanese government bills as a substitute form of collateral. The reason why Japanese firms might be having trouble with their dollar, dollar funding activities, their dollar needs, is perceptions about risks due to China. If you're a dollar provider, there is some spillover potential from problems going on in China, maybe some losses, maybe some difficulties in getting payments and fundings and cash flows, everything to line up. Maybe you, you don't want to provide as many dollars, or maybe you don't want to swap collateral. You don't want to give out treasury bills to a Japanese firm that is, in your estimation, exposed to the Chinese problem, especially if the Chinese problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So as, as your risk perception rises, you take defensive actions, which causes the Japanese firms to take evasive action to find alternatives, including these swaps, which then increase the demand for Japanese government bills. And the more desperate the situation for the Japanese dollar borrowers, the more they are willing to give pay higher premiums, the more the dollar providers will then demand Japanese government bills as a substitute, even if the, the, the negative rates on those bills gets even more negative. Because again, you're getting, as a dollar provider, you're getting paid in the swap, not the Japanese bill as an investment. So the close correlation between risk perceptions about China, dollar providing, collateral in the middle, Japanese government bills as an, uh, as an emergency sort of substitute for collateral in the treasury market, it's all one package. And again, it goes back several years. And the importance of Tokyo, China, is a, is a redistribution point to China. That's something that should be common knowledge and well-known, but... Most people believe that we're all just islands. That's where the term decoupling comes from, that China's problems are China. What does that have to do with Japan, let alone the United States or anywhere else in the world? It's the euro dollar system, which makes everything globally synchronized. And if we look at China as a big, huge risk, 
that risk perception spills over as much as negative impacts through trade channels and otherwise. What we've seen recently in Japanese government bills is the same thing that we've seen in repo markets. That is relatively benign conditions. We had a whole bunch of, a whole major mess of problems earlier this year when U.S. regional banks were in the spotlight of deflationary money and collateral shortages that we had in spades in March, April, and into May. And you saw the same thing in Japanese government bills. Those plummeted in yield, skyrocketed in price, just like U.S. Treasury bills had. But since then, ever since, oh, Janet Yellen really started, first of all, the debt ceiling deal was made, and then Janet Yellen started issuing more and more Treasury bills. Conditions in collateral, therefore, some of the dollar funding environment has been more benign. And sure enough, we see the same thing in J-bills. Their yields have become much less negative up until recently. I'm getting some more indications that the benign, the benignness that has been caused in part, in large part because of the flood of treasury bills by the government as it continues to borrow more and more and more, that uh, now we're seeing potential risk aversion overwhelm the increased supply to create more, more detectable tightness in some of the repo indications, including Japanese government bills, though it hasn't been all that much just yet. In the three month J bill, for example, the negative, the rate, the equivalent yield got as high as negative 0.98%, which is the highest in quite some time. That was just a couple weeks ago on August 9th. Now we see it roll over a bit to now we're heading down toward minus 0.12%, which isn't a lot, but and it may just be a short-term fluctuation, but it is consistent with an uptick in collateral indications through the US dollar side of things. For, think, for example, uh, factors like repo fails. Repo fails have been up recently. We saw repo fails jump to 234.7 billion that same week of August 9th, which that's not a huge number, of, uh, certainly in the context of 2023, but that's up from 145.5 billion, which was a couple weeks before that, which had been the lowest since September 2021. So repo fails have come up, and in the week of August 9th, the 234.7 billion in fails, that was the highest in five weeks, going back to early July. So it may be that with China really heating up, we could be seeing the beginning parts of the next collateral squeeze develop and develop maybe if we get confirmation, further confirmation through the Japanese government bill market, it may be China, Japan, US dollar providers, which is why we say CNY down equals bad because CNY down already expresses potential deflationary impediments in the euro dollar system, maybe not necessarily about the collateral shortage, but in other balance sheet capacity and risk aversion ways. That is obviously impacting Japan already because we see CNY and JPY tied together as, as, as close together as anything, any currency pair you'll see. And beyond that, if it starts to infect the collateral system, it starts to create problems in collateral, more scarcity, more potential shortages, then it's not just China's problem, it's a Euro dollar problem, which means it's everyone's problem. So it's something that we need to keep a close eye on as we get closer to September. If you want to see more about circulation problems and deflationary euro dollar, what that means, check out the video below me. As always, a huge thank you for joining me. Bigger thank you to Euro Dollar University subscribers and an immense non-deflationary thank you to Euro Dollar University members. Until next time, everyone take care.